Um, we're back. We're back. What's up, Anna? Um, what's up with you? Nothing. I'm yeah. Maintaining. Yeah. I'm Breastfeeding like, still. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna go on for like the next four years. <laughs> the next twelve years. Yeah. Uh, how long do you think you will breastfeed your your baby? Like a year. That I seems think normal, right? The minimum recommended is six months. Mm. Yeah, that I sounds. Think, and then formula or? Uh, you wean them to solid food. When can they start eating hot dogs? <laughs> like six months. <laughs> cool. You got it. You have to puree it in like a, a ninja blender. Right. Cause, Firstly, because it's a choking hazard. The baby yeah. food. Yeah. Popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm good. I went to Birmingham, Alabama this weekend. Yeah, it looked lovely. I was living vicariously through your stories. I love a good wedding. It was it was the best wedding I think I've ever been to. Okay. Um, How many weddings have you been to? Not that many. One, one. <laughs> not at that. Not a ton. Yeah. I've been to some nice ones. Yeah. But this was um, this one was great because it was like it wasn't like some mason jar twee wedding. It was very like black type Birmingham country club. Yeah. Um, old money. Yeah, you know, it literally looked like a Whit Stillman movie, and Whit Stillman was there. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Sophie <laughs> saw that pic. It was really cute. Cut love and friendship. Yeah, it felt like a Whit Stillman movie. It was very, it was beautiful. Yeah, gorgeous, um, and very like not just like maskless, mm-hmm. but also just like no. It was the first thing I'd have gone to. I think where. Um, I didn't find myself having a conversation about like how crazy these uncertain times are, yeah. you know, it was very like loving and positive and uplifting. Yeah. I mean, it looked great and it was maskless in Alabama. Like wedding aside, just pretty much totally maskless all around. Yeah. How did you, uh, find Alabama? Is it white supremacist enough for you? Well, they have this, so they have like the large, the tallest, statue in america or okay. maybe the statue called the vulcan because uh-huh. birmingham um was extremely prosperous uh-huh. uh like post civil war because they had um steel forging uh-huh. they had like <laughs> lots of like uh steel mining and forging and like it's a very like industrious city so they erected this like statue called the vulcan Mm -hmm. who's like the roman god of uh slavery (laughs) sorry (laughs) they do do this thing in birmingham because i did do a couple like touristy things Uh where they allude to including i went to the museum at like the vulcan statue and they they talk about their civil rights history (laughs) as if it's just like a feature of which i think is actually a healthy way of kind of like integrating it rather than yeah whitewashing it or something they it is kind of present definitely yeah like the specter of slavery hangs over the city so wait what is so the vulcan is the roman god of of forging of like fire and steel and stuff and so he's doing like he has like some kind of tool in his hand and he's extending his arm out kind Mm -hmm. of in a a gesture (laughs) yeah reminiscent of like a sieg hail kind of Uh vibe um which makes sense because it's he's a roman god and it's it's it does have like a fashy vibe yeah crypto fascist yeah (laughs) Um, but the town itself is is very charming and lovely. Yeah, is it like a white and I wasn't fence there. type thing, or one of those mm. towns that's like a corporate downtown? No, I went to Nashville afterwards. Okay, uh, with Dan because he had to go for work, mm-hmm. and Nashville is very like we work ass hellhole yeah. like condo strip mall shithole kind of yeah it sounds it seems like a fake ass like potemkin village of a country town though i spent even less time there i'm sure it has its has its charms as well but birmingham's very like um i stayed in a like a victorian era like mansion Mm -hmm. that's like was from like the 1890s that's like a bed and breakfast yeah and it's more of that vibe it's kind of like kitschy old south Uh uh-huh plantations 
plants. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I didn't go to any. Well, I didn't go to like a plantation a wedding. Plantation or wedding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm sure that they they exist for sure. Yeah, I, like plantations in Birmingham. Yeah, that like people still kind have of have weddings. Yeah, yeah, that are like covered in like taxidermied game, and uh, mm-hmm. they're still like black butlers. Like nothing's changed. You know. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a bit of there's a bit of that, but it doesn't. I don't know. My yeah. impression of it was that it was sort of like a a well integrated kind of not as depressed as a lot of other places in that part of the country are. Yeah, you know, I really want to go to Savannah, Georgia, because hmm. I hear it's really beautiful and kind of haunted but I'm like afraid of running into Ryder Rips at the one like neoliberal hipster cafe. That Does they must he live there? I think he did at some point last time I checked. I don't know. Why? I don't know. That That's, I don't know why I have that thought in my head. We need to fact check that. I, for some reason that's an association in my mind, but I'm also like really deranged and demented right now. I'm like, I feel like Joe Biden. I can't <laughs> string, <laughs> string sentences together. So this will be a fun episode because it'll be very like impressionistic and associative. Right. Yeah. So we're doing, um, one of our film episodes yeah. that are much beloved. I realized that we forgot to announce ahead of time right. that we're watching a film, but it's fine because everybody's seen this movie obviously so it'll be fine if you haven't you can watch it yeah it's easily available it's the 20th anniversary of its uh premiere Mm -hmm. it can or it was last week uh Mulholland Drive yeah directed by David Lynch Mm -hmm. white supremacist hetero (laughs) patriarchal director David Lynch exactly we'll also be talking about um an article that was in the Los Angeles Review of Books called The Malleability of Mulholland Drive at 20 by Suzanne Enzerink. Yeah. Uh, wherein she does, we'll get to it, but basically yeah. predi- she does a, I thought would be kind of predictable feminist revision mm-hmm. of Lynch, but even the lengths that she went to surprised even me. Yeah. It, I thought it would be yeah, like kind of a typical predictable kind of hemming and hedging, but it was really chaotic and insane. And I, I'm glad I went along for the ride. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it felt like a David Lynch movie, all these twists and turns <laughs> and dream sequences. Yeah. Um, so what do you think Mulholland Drive is about? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I wanted to ask you actually, uh, I guess we can, summarize the plot for the listeners I, it really is like the most red like scare every, movie of all time definitely it, again the, the my most favorite roast that anyone did of us was like years ago on the subreddit where uh they likened us to uh the chicks from the home drive betty and rita yeah played by naomi watts and, and laura henning herring. herring laura elena herring i think she's latinx yes she is um but yeah the joke was like uh, a delusional Um, anorexic blonde actress and a brain damaged big titted brunette (laughs) teaming up to put their limited intellects together to try and make (laughs) sense of things (laughs) yeah so that but the but the movie really is like you can kind of hear them think truly as they're trying to like uh, come together and it's like a very um uh, female friendly flick it's almost a chick flick almost yeah. yeah yeah well lynch calls it a a love story yeah it's like a, a an homage to this the seedy and sinister underbelly of tinseltown of tinseltown yeah so yeah so betty the blonde yeah is an actress who arrives in los angeles to stay at her aunt's apartment mm-hmm. where she discovers um the, a brunette who has been in a car accident and has stumbled into the, yeah. into the bungalow um, because she's suffering from amnesia and can't remember who she is. And uh-huh. then they pair up to um, figure out what's really going on. And then there's other little little vignettes and like storylines. It was originally a TV pilot. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. David Lynch directed it, uh, I think in like 98. Okay. As like a 90 minute long like TV pilot for ABC after Twin Peaks. Uh-huh. 
and they hated it apparently yeah and thought that one of the little like because i watched it on amazon prime they give you little like tidbits Uh uh-huh if you pause the movie oh really okay they thought that the actresses were too old to be to be on television so then he got um money from like a french studio to shoot more over the course of another year and tie up the loose ends yeah i noticed that the all the kind of production team all had these kind of mysteriously french jewish names it was like pierre edelman Mm -hmm. um okay that makes sense that's crazy that that um the studio said the actresses were too old i mean how old are they like 35 tops or not that old i think no just speaking for myself (laughs) i think she was even younger yeah maybe she but she kind of looked the same age for yes a long time yeah she's a very underrated well not anymore she kind of got her her um time in the limelight but she's a very underrated actress she's really good but this was the movie that really put her um, like on the map on the map my and idea of like a good actress is like if you're like Australian or from New Zealand and you can do the American accent. There's some no, like, there really is something about Australian actresses yeah. and actors yeah. where they're extra good. Yeah. I don't know if it's because there's so many of them in Los Angeles because of like the climate or something, but um, Nicole Kidman, mm-hmm. another secret Aussie. Oh, yeah, right. Mel Gibson, my favorite mm-hmm. of all time. <laughs> But there's something, I don't know, you find it with like British actors too. Maybe it's something about like affecting the American accent that makes them, grounds their performances in some way or something. But yeah, she's fantastic in it. Yeah, she's like very subtle and nuanced. Sorry, my eye is like twitching. (laughs) I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Laura Elena Herring, I have to say, is like not a particularly good actress, but she didn't really. But she have doesn't to need be, to be, yeah, because yeah, she's got those great knockers. Yeah, she's got the great knockers, and I think like one thing I do appreciate about David Lynch is that a lot of the acting is like bad because it's incidental, kind of to, and it's also kind of I think an inside joke. Totally, like I think he enjoys. Um, schlockiness and camp and bad taste Mm -hmm. yeah and he's not invested in realism or naturalism yeah Yeah. so performances aren't the important parts of of his film yeah yeah and the rita character the sort of demands of her performance as like a brain dead person Mm -hmm. are she rises to the occasion yeah. too. And I think she, in her, her acting style being kind of vapid actually works because yeah. she's sort of like the object of Betty's desire. Yeah. She's kind of like an empty vessel mm-hmm. uh, onto which Betty projects her deepest desires and insecurities. Um, she's like, you know, Leo DiCaprio and what's eating Gilbert grape. <laughs> Gilbert. I love that movie too. We should watch that one. <laughs> Every Bye. time. Yeah, we should. I would love that because you know, it's prime it's prime territory for ableism and fat shaming. It's like really up our alley, mm-hmm. I think. It's time to do a a feminist ableist review. <laughs> yeah. of what's eating Gilbert Grape? A, a colonialism. <laughs> you did a fat phobia. <laughs> um no, and every, I get into a lot of trouble every time I like suggests that leo dicaprio is like stunning in that role and that it's his best role because people are like how hard is it to play like a retarded person but i actually think it's, it's a lot really harder than a, hard it's not that easy it's really hard because you can't to do it plausibly yeah you can't be like too retarded or not retarded enough yeah it's you like can't. it's a real sweet spot it is incredibly hard i am sam for example does not hold up in the same way that what's eating gilbert grape does yeah that's true i hadn't thought of that but that is really true but <laughs> you have to stay in character which is harder than it looks go, in that well i've been going deep method for a long time <laughs> in preparation for <laughs> for my finest role yeah you're, you're playing a retarded person I'm playing a retarded pod- <laughs> podcaster <laughs> would you ever play a retarded person if mm. it was like the right role and it was a lot of money. I mean, how retarded? Like uh, Gilbert Grape style. 
Um, yeah, maybe. If for, the script was good. For artistic the material, integrity. Yeah, I'm, I take my craft seriously. Would you gain 40 pounds for a role? I would. Okay. For sure. Nice. I mean, I'd probably kill myself, but. <laughs> well, they'd put you on a regimen of like yeah, um, calorie exactly. like loading and then they'd put you on a regimen of like they'd make it worth weight loss, they'd make yeah. it worth my while and it would be interesting for me i'm as as a actor i am yeah. interested in exploring the you know the ranges of human experience from slightly <laughs> slightly to overweight retarded. to retarded <laughs> a little bit in between um, anyway so but I think I'd actually be a good, um, a good cast casting for a retarded person because I've got the. I look like I got bonked on the head already. <laughs> good work. <laughs> I think it would be great if somebody cast you in a in a role about like um, Russian orphanage children, mm. like wayfish orphan girls. Well, I'd have to, you know, I'm getting up there in age. Yeah, right? but that's okay. <laughs> that's acting that's the whole point of acting D- different pe- different actors of different ages and races should play different roles because it's all about inhabiting somebody else's consciousness right and the universality of the yeah. continuum of human experience is totally i agree so okay Mulholland drive so rita and betty mm-hmm. team up to figure out who the circumstances rita is. yeah basically yeah and uh, betty actually proves um even though she's kind of like um wide-eyed and wet behind the ears <coughs> bless you do you that say bless you if you cough there has to <laughs> we have to come up with a, another expression anyway, betty actually proves to be very kind of um pragmatic and um shrewd mm-hmm. like she's brave suggests, brave girl yeah and she like suggests to rita for example that they call the police using a payphone um, to see if there was an accident in the Hollywood Hills mm-hmm. near Mulholland Drive. Which there like, was. Which there was, like details like that. Um, and as they kind of near the uncovering Rita's true identity, I guess Betty's own identity, her own consciousness starts to unravel in a way. Is that your take on it? Well, I, that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you subscribe to like the most popular dreamscape interpretation of it, which is that um, Betty is actually the kind of dream fantasy alter ego of uh, this Diane, Diane Selwyn, who's a, a kind of washed up failed actress? I think it's more complicated than that. I think... Um I think the film is a masterpiece. Yeah. And honestly, like fairly close to perfect. But I think that a lot of its metaphysical dreamy qualities can be attributed to the fact that it was a television pilot Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was wrapped up into like a feature. Yeah. um, And that there are things that like Lynch left deliberately ambiguous and he likes probably due to doing like transcendental meditation uh is cultural appropriation <laughs> uh i think his obviously his strengths as a filmmaker are that he's very he's very tapped into the unconscious yeah and he works in a very instinctive way and the movie's very open to many different interpretations i don't think there's like a right way to yeah. to read it but i do think basically i mean thematically and the the linear narrative of it if you want to like assemble one does kind of track with i actually think it's um i do think the movie is like a dream mm-hmm. um but whose dream is the question the I guess. bomb behind the dumpster yeah really I think that's the your bo- theory i think it's the bomb's dream really <laughs> the blackface bomb the blackface bomb actually played by a woman oh really okay <laughs> fun fact did, did not know that um just looks like your typical garden variety leftist but <laughs> <laughs> you're they them the dsa <laughs> meeting behind the the dumpster at winky's diner <laughs> um uh but base but basically i think that there is like a dream analysis kind of dream logic to be made made of the movie yeah and, which is why the other sort of 
storyline um, is about a director who is casting a lead actress in a film that sort of has been strong armed from him by like mobsters basically. Yeah. And they are telling him to cast this actress named Camilla Rhodes, who in the second half of the movie is played by the same actress who plays Rita. Uh Um, And Betty, who is now Diane Selwyn is like her, sort of bitter estranged lesbian lover yeah and all of the the shift in the movie happens when they find this box that a blue key that rita has in her purse unlocks and then it like switches into the diane yeah. selwyn part of the part of the film but i don't think either i think that they're more like kind of parallel realities rather than diane yeah. selwyn being real and betty not and Betty being like a fantasy projection. Yeah. I have really kind of no dog in the fight. So I, I I think like the beauty of this film is that it's uh, subjective and open-ended and, um, uh, contains many different interpretations, but yeah, I guess the most obvious one that critics have suggested is that, um, Betty slash Diane are the same person and Rita slash Camilla are the same person. Um, I'm only convinced of that because Rita and Camilla are both like Latina names. So it makes sense. I think <laughs> well, na- Rita's not her real name. She yeah, sees yeah. a poster. Yeah, 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 yeah. She sees like a Rita Hayworth poster or something. So there's, I'm curious what the other names are allusions to because they all sound kind of vaguely old Hollywood. And the film that um, the director played by Justin Thoreau yeah. is casting is called the Sylvia North story, which also has probably some dreamy significance in the film yeah. that I haven't unpacked. We'll get to this, but I'm really shocked that um, the the woke reviewer from the LA Times uh, didn't accuse David Lynch of anti-Semitism because the, the Justin Thoreau character is like so obviously like, uh, I mean, it, I, it's a great character, but it's like <laughs> such an anti-Semitic trope. You think? Yeah, his name is like Adam Kesher, Adam <laughs> Kessler. <laughs> yeah oh before i forget i i want to plug hmm. eli's new uh record which is coming out in a month uh, hell yeah which you can look at my stories to get more info on but yeah he's like a kind of nebbish uh cuckolded cuckolded jewish stereotype hollywood schmoozer yeah and he's like militantly annoying and aggressive Mm -hmm. but like can't get his own way though at the end it's implied he does get his own way because he sells out to the this kind of like shadowy supernatural mob organization Mm -hmm. um but i think like you know the main theme that runs uh through all of david lynch's work is like really on on display here which is that there's like a seedy underbelly um like a current of evil that runs through the kind of american white picket fence reality Mm -hmm. um and it can't ever be explained yeah, that it has a a metaphysical dimension. Yeah, so um, basically he doesn't really seek to explain it. And I think he's really good at capturing the kind of like effective or emotional quality of, mm-hmm. of fear or anxiety. Yeah, and I think what makes it such an enduring, masterful film is that it does appeal to people on like a subconscious level yeah and that's really what people want because i think all films are kind of like dreams yeah even in like the experience of watching a film is a kind of like disillusion of ego that also occurs when one has a dream and i Mm -hmm. think that they function in similar sort of mm, planes of consciousness or something and so yeah. his movies are very satisfying in play. They're not just like avant-garde, like random art films. They have like a cohesive logic. It just is one that's based in a more expansive consciousness or something. Yeah, it's not immediately accessible. I mean, the thing is like, I think all films uh, like Dreams open a kind of aperture through which like, you get like rep- like leakage of repressed mm-hmm. elements in your mm-hmm. subconscious. Yeah. And I think like the reason that people are so 
attracted to to and captivated by like movies in general um is because they really let you kind of escape into fantasy i mean this is like a very old and predictable critique going yeah. back to the days like the advent of like silent films well and even old theater i mean yeah has to do with catharsis in yeah. its most ancient form <laughs> the, the greek word i mean <laughs> And then, yeah, ego dissolution or like radical association through which you experience catharsis. Yeah. Are all part of like a dramatic theatrical experience. Yeah. But you can definitely see, I think, how this film was first intended as a TV show because there are these random kind of dissociated scenes like i think it, this it's like the second or the third scene the two guys in winkies the diner uh one of them like suffers a heart attack when this like homeless blackface creature mm-hmm. steps out from behind the restaurant um the scene with the hitman yeah where he's charged by the he accidentally shoots an obese woman in the adjacent <laughs> office and she like charges him squealing like a hog and he <laughs> overpowers her and but has to kill her and then a janitor who like witnessed the crime which that but scene, then him and then the demon and the guy from the diner all sort of come back into the yeah into it, the fold into the, the focus, end of the, yeah the but you film. can see how they were like kind of almost like free floating scenes the scene where adam kesher goes back to his house and catches his um, wife in bed with a literal cabana boy played by Billy Ray Cyrus. Mm-hmm. Like there are all these scenes that would, I guess, ostensibly lend themselves to like a shorter format or something that seemed like they were like, or that things that would be developed upon yeah. in, in subsequent episodes. Yeah. All at twin peaks. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah. And I think in, in this film, he basically kind of sets his gaze on, hollywood and la as a metonym for hollywood they're they're kind of like Mm -hmm. you know the same thing in his mind yeah and the sort of production and casting of the film within the film i think is significant because well sets film sets as well as stages as well as so i have a lot of dreams about being on set (laughs) (laughs) um because I think I've been spending a fair amount of time on a set, obviously, yeah. but also because they're kind of, they're very symbolically loaded spaces as are stages mm-hmm. because they deal with sort of presentation and facade and back performance and like backstage front of stage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're very dreamy spaces so it's a very it was i don't know really clever and masterful to make sort of a movie about a dream that's about a movie yeah (laughs) yeah it's like meta on many levels it's like hyper meta hyper meta it's like a a russian nesting doll um of i've read various like reviews of this film and i've also read various guides to this film and Um, I've seen it claimed that there is actually a very cohesive and coherent story that if you follow the clues, you can crack Mm -hmm. it. And I think like I have no desire to do that because it's better kind of unresolved and unattainable. Yeah. Like it's better as, as I feel like I have a sequence deeper and more coherent understanding of it without necessarily understanding every detail of the linear narrative yeah and weirdly enough i think david lynch does have a very like intuitive and feminine approach to filmmaking Mm. which is funny because i mean again we'll get to this but this um woke reviewer woman essentially accuses him of um being a misogynist who kind of foists the white male narrative Mm -hmm. onto cinema and kind of revels in the exploitation of women which yeah. is completely like bizarre like i have my critiques of david lynch but that's just like a completely bizarre and out of line one and that in his evasiveness around plot i'll read it a little later yeah um right that he undermines any like critiques that he makes about society at large which i don't think he does he nor does he need yeah. to yeah um well i wanted to talk about mary sweeney Mm-hmm. Who, Wait, who's that? She's the editor of the film okay. who was married to David Lynch. Okay. Who also um, cut 
Fire Walk With Me and mm, I think she was an assistant editor on Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart uh-huh. and she edited Lost Highway too. Mm-hmm. And I think editors really get slept on. <laughs> yeah. Especially for Lynn, like what gives the movie it's that the feeling of that dream logic, I think really is the editing much yeah. more than obviously all aspects of, of filmmaking are important. Directing being the most important, but um, I think the fact that he worked very closely with a female editor who was his wife for such a long, significant portion of his career mm-hmm is important i can't believe she didn't get credit <laughs> i mean she did no yeah. i know i'm kidding she's just like, <laughs> she's like jamila jamil like writing medium articles and instagram <laughs> captions about how he has to like publicly give her credit um yeah i mean the editing by the way i'll have you know is totally a woman's sport when we're better been. at it than men mm-hmm. i edit all of eli's uh, collateral <laughs> Uh, but like uh, also martin scorsese his edit longtime editor schumacher yeah the, she might as well she may as well be his wife hitchcock like, married his his editor as well yeah that feels like such a dysfunctional relationship the the relationship between um a, a male director and a female editor mm-hmm. like it must be so con- contentious it's like you know having no i mean it must create a lot of like horny friction i think maybe not i mean i wouldn't know i would only i've only worked with my editor sophie yeah. who just who's got a, married yeah who's a chick because i think women are like really good at like catching minor mistakes and then like chiseling away at your will to live by pointing them out I'm kidding. <laughs> but also the the sort of feminine intuitive vibe that you were yeah. describing of his films mahal and drive especially can really be attributed to the to the editing yeah and lynch almost it's weird because i don't like Lynch has nothing gay about him. He is like a very hetero. Um, he's just Midwestern. Yeah. Where is he from? I um, I was going to say, I'm surprised he's not like Canadian. Was to, um, Montana or Wisconsin? I, oh, well, cause I made a film with his son. Yeah. Right. I remember this. Riley. Yeah. Um, who's the spawn of him and Mary Sweeney. Okay. And are um, they divorced or? Yeah. They, okay. Um, I think they were married brief very briefly okay. but i'm actually not sure um and that was in montana mm-hmm. and at like a lake house that lynch owned or used to own so okay. i think he's either from there or has spent a lot of time there but he is from like the middle of the country and his sensibility is very midwestern yeah which it's is very, essentially like, canadian hokey. i guess yeah. yeah well yeah but i think you know how old is he he's he's not is he a boomer uh david lynch or is he like an old gen xer no he's definitely he's a boomer he's like must be in his 70s okay let's look this up um i think like a david keith lynch that's very american yeah 46 so yeah he's he's kind of like an advanced boomer um from missoula montana okay montana yeah um a- but aquarius he, totally yeah yeah that makes sense but he has a very um kind of like hetero vibe first of all i think like i primarily appreciate david lynch as like the chief american curator of hotness Mm. like he had the most beautiful people in his films i think the kind of golden age of lynch corresponds to like the golden age of beauty in america Mm. because you know like i think we've talked about this like i love old hollywood actresses obviously but they're a little like out of my time zone you know mm-hmm. they're like i'm not like really like into elizabeth taylor or sophia loren because they're just too old i don't really yeah like, i know I like, what you mean i don't have like a context yeah to appreciate it like they're beautiful and it's great and da 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 but right like Marilyn monroe whatever but i i like like the david lynch girls totally i mean twin peaks yeah and i love that rolling stone cover of like laura flynn boyle and charlon fenn and i think her name is madchen amic on the cover in that kind of like quasi lesbian embrace i don't know wearing nude body suits and jeans it's beautiful i'll send it to you <laughs> um but he's he's equivalent there um to me to like eric romer who's like the curator of hotness of france Mm -hmm. like all his girls are different but they're all like so beautiful and they like come alive on the screen and it's like joyful actors as as models yeah essentially and like 
which also goes back to like when you aren't placing a premium on kind of like singular charismatic uh, naturalistic performance yeah you can cast by hotter people because you yeah. need something just really specific from them exactly you know um just to be like hot and retarded and kind screen. of yeah like assemble them yeah into the mise-en-scene and let it play out yeah and that's probably also like my biggest critique of of lynch is that i find him sometimes to be somewhat glib and superficial and more concerned with like coolness or aesthetics and with artistry like that's like my long-running critique but i also think like i've like dialed that back a lot because i agree with something um jack the perfume nationalist mm-hmm. said where he was like okay well he's like basically like an old master of american cinema and you have to respect and appreciate him whether or not you agree with him for sure and I, agree, I agree with that yeah he's well, like in I the like, mount rushmore of american directors absolutely one of the best we've ever produced yeah and i like him because he's not hyper referential or he doesn't have um sort of like reverence for canon the way that a lot of directors mm-hmm. do like paul schrader who i also love who are like um super like cinephilic and literate and like Mm -hmm. uh making kind of sophisticated references i think he has a very cohesive singular aesthetic that he's operating through very instinctively yeah and that that's just incredibly rare yeah it's cool i mean he's he is like and i mean this like with all deference and respect he's essentially a provincial bumpkin and those people make the best artists because he's coming out of nowhere and he's like marinating in his own amniotic mm-hmm. fluid and coming up with the canon. And like, I've said this before and I'll say it again, but like um, the greatest artists are those who manage to translate their private personal idiom into a universal canon. And he's done that. Yeah. Like David Lynch is like, you know, he must be responsible for so many like set designs and like fashion editorials and I don't know Definitely. music videos and that's why his imitators really fall short because yeah. they aren't doing the sort of searching inward cultivating of his own experiences and aesthetics and like synthesizing cinema out of that yeah rather than like referencing things that have already been done yeah they're not understanding it for themselves they're yeah. plucking it from somebody else they think they're going to make like a lynchian film but they'd never be able to yeah it's one of the most hideous adjectives that exists i know lynchian i just like shudder but he is like i mean david lynch is like the uh windowless room with like heavy curtains and mm-hmm. like a red carpet or whatever that's like his thing it appears in twin peaks it appears in checkerboard yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's like a perverse like american uh diner aesthetic mm-hmm. um it's like edward it's like edward hopper-esque right um but yeah and i i have i have a theory though that like when you have somebody who's like a paragon like a canonical artist who is actually good when they come on the scene, they ruin it for everybody else like thereafter because everybody tries to imitate them and it, and it spawns a lot of like cheap facsimiles, cheap imitations. Like I think Stanley Kubrick, who I love is like one of my favorite directors really ruined cinema with 2001, a space odyssey. Mm -hmm. And I think like Kate Moss, who's like one of my favorite models. who I love really ruined modeling with heroin chic (laughs) because they spawn a bunch of like shitty imitators. You know what I'm saying? Totally. But both of those people were like one of a kind. Yeah. And it wasn't like their fault. And there's a reason that it's endured. Yeah. And why Mulholland Drive really holds up Mm -hmm. and still feels super contemporary. Well, yeah. Okay. This woman in the LA Times review basically said as much in her own retarded way where she was like, oh yeah, well, you know, we have to interrogate this film on its 20th anniversary because it really holds up and it really kind of like strikes a chord. And of course she like took the, like glean the absolute wrong conclusions from it Mm -hmm. but even she could feel that it like is an enduring test of time yeah and i think i don't know if it's the most i'm trying to think of like the limited menu of like lynch films i've seen i think that it's probably my favorite lynch they i mean i hadn't seen it in a long time and like i like 
lots of young cinephiles watched his movies in like high school and college mm-hmm. and stuff and they like left an impression and I never really revisited mm-hmm. Blue Velvet I've maybe seen the most uh-huh. and maybe it's my favorite though now after rewatching Mulholland Drive I would agree maybe with you that it's his best it I feel like it's the most kind of I, I don't want to sound like annoying and pretentious but it's like the most kind of like sophisticated mm-hmm. And thoughtful of yeah. his films, I guess. Yeah. And I its haven't... failure as a pilot and then sort of making it into what it is so perfectly is so impressive. Mm-hmm. And I do, I really think the, like the, the chat chattiest thing about, about <laughs> David Lynch is his like um, TM tip, like the, the meditating. And I think that that, comes across in his filmmaking wait you think it's the chattiest thing about him like makes him like the most chad (laughs) why wait (laughs) unpack this because he's really drawing from his own um internal reserves yeah of creativity and productivity okay and i think that you wouldn't have been able to to salvage a, a television pilot unless you were like on a total like galaxy brain yeah meditative like flow state or something where it's like he made so many decisions over the he cast um his actresses off of off of headshots he just oh, saw pictures whoa. of them and was That's like cool. drawn to them and so he like he's just like he's definitely corny. like tapped has, into something yeah. i think he just i think he's really kind of relentlessly hetero which i mean in a positive sense mm-hmm. not in a negative way that like feminists use it today and i think he's like him, like a hot horny man who has an eye for beauty and he recognizes beauty in women and he likes sexy women which is cool so well, that's that a chat really move. helps yeah. yeah and that really makes the film incredibly watchable mm-hmm. but structurally there's things happening with it that I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I but my my take on the TM stuff is that it comes off as annoying and pretentious especially when he's like selling it through his school or foundation or whatever. But that's partly because he's an artistic genius, so he can indulge in a practice like transcendental meditation and get something from it, but most people who indulge in it are kind of thundering mediocrities with artistic aspirations. Yeah. I think, you know, there's only, there's limits to how expansive one's consciousness can get. And he is operating at a, as a, as an artist, as a filmmaker, that's sort of at the outer limits of it. And other people are sort of more reined in. And even if they did TM for their entire lives, probably wouldn't, would mean anything from it yeah it seems like a very la thing to be into totally he probably likes juice too for sure and like cleanses (laughs) and and intermittent (laughs) fasting or whatever um the other thing is like i was thinking like there's he really is not like again like there's anything like gay about his oeuvre how do you pronounce that word i hate oeuvre oeuvre um but he has a very feminine touch and i've struggled to reconcile that but i think it's also because he's like literally a chad and he's mastered masculinity so he's not intimidated by femininity totally like he's very fluid and he's like one of those um like army sergeants who transitions into being a woman because he's like so masculine that there's nothing left for him (laughs) it's the final frontier yeah well yeah when i was skimming the sort of uh the Wikipedia for Mulholland Drive to get an overview of all the different reads. Uh There was a portion about um, like queer film theory Uh making the case that like Mulholland Drive is actually a really, it was, I found, I found it so annoying (laughs) because I hate this thing that like queer theorists and like media theorists do where they like, call stuff queer just because it's like confusing yeah or like mahal and drive is a scene yeah it's like the lesbian stuff but also like because of the non-linear narrative mahal and drive is like a queer movie and it's like definitely not yeah no that's it's not queer at all it's it's actually very white and but that's a real propensity of the of like the queer media theorist sex yeah. is to be like it doesn't make any sense because it's so queer yeah and then they'll write like a 
a treatise about it, like queering the Holland Drive. Exactly. And you have to, like, listen to, but yeah, I mean, and also like that lesbian scene is like the straightest thing ever. It's so sick. It's not. Yeah, it's like really cool, but it's not like I. The baby was watching the the movie mm-hmm. with us, and because I think he likes, you know, like I said to you, like understands the shapes and the sounds. He was and like, the, and I was like, oh god, ba- the, baby's the, first lesbian scene. Baby's first frontal nudity. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also like yeah the, this movie also it's from 2001 right or yeah yeah it's awesome it like came out it came out like right before 9 11 totally I think. yeah yeah the sopranos was on tv yeah fucking mulholland drive comes out yeah but it's the sopranos by the way is not dissimilar to mulholland drive it's a similar kind of like dream sequence mm-hmm. there are a lot of dreams yeah, there are a lot of dream sequences sopranos. well it's also because it also deals with psychology yeah well it's it's literally this movie and the show are both about like fukuyama's end of history but in a negative way it's about the total triumph of, of uh, liberalism and then 9 11 happens it's like really quite beautiful mm-hmm. that the, like 2000 is the culmination 2000 one sorry is also the culmination of like the greatest phase of lesbianism which is like gen x lipstick lesbianism Mm -hmm. when they were like hot and thin yeah this is like you know before lesbians became well a lot of feminist film scholars actually (laughs) they make the case that um the 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 latter portion of the film we're in we're in like diane selwyn's reality Mm -hmm. and Rita, who's then Camilla, mm-hmm. um, betrays her by like marrying the the director. Mm-hmm. Is about like the heterosexual betrayal and the way in which like lesbianism is always thwarted by like patriarchal power dynamics. Yeah, yeah. That this woman who whose article <laughs> we have been discussing, but we will discuss, makes a similar point and. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that. I think a lot of rep- lesbianism is like recreational and transient. Um, well, that bisexuality maybe. Yeah, but, but literally it's about- all women are on some spectrum of bisexuality. Sure. Um, what I'm saying is that it's not it's not the social conditions of the um, white male cishet patriarchy that. Um, causes women to betray one another it's like women's innate Mm -hmm. biology um yeah and to me it's not really about it's about desire and it's not about identity yeah it's and And that's why like identity ultimately in the film also is malleable yeah it's not a movie about two lesbians you know yeah it's like a white lesbian and a latinx lesbian (laughs) And one of them is in the DSA. Passing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, also like no offense to these fem- feminist film scholars, but it's also about like, just like sheer um, naked professional opportunism. She leaves Diane Selwyn for Adam Kesher. Cause he can, cause he's the provi- director. He's a director. He's yeah. a pa- power player in Hollywood. And yeah. Diane is like a kind of washed up f- actress who's like going nowhere who has no power and i think it's also yeah it's also misguided to read too much into the the lesbian stuff yeah because there is just also a very straightforward way in which um sex and lesbian sex in particular is incredibly cinematic yeah totally and that's really sort of like what you were saying the strength of lynch as a filmmaker is all the big brain stuff aside it's like every sequence every scene is like successful and engrossing because he knows how to like make a movie that is entertaining yeah no exactly it is that this i say as as praise of lynch and not criticism um again he's very tacky and trashy he's very tuned into um film is a populist medium yeah it really is and he's really tuned into like the trashy cheap kind of mass market s- symbols and, and signals. And totally. Th- he's like Prince, you know, like you listen to Prince's music and it's so um, like chintzy and melodramatic, like his aesthetic feels good, but it's so much fun. Um, I don't think anyone would argue with you that Prince is, is 
one of the best musicians of all time. But he's tacky and trashy, mm-hmm. right? Which is his more appeal. so than Michael Jackson. But th- but it's I think a very self conscious like language that he develops. I was going to yeah. say idiom, and then it's I felt a cultivated, yeah vocab visual vocabulary yeah david lynch is like the prince of cinema also, i actually yeah fluid gay straight continuum yeah like with a prince guy as well a guy who was plugged into in touch with femininity as they say but was relentlessly straight mm-hmm. and it that's actually like a really apt comparison so straight he's basically gay yeah exactly it's like the horseshoe theory of chad dumb <laughs> but prince also like collected the most beautiful women around yeah and he was a man and not particularly great looking but you know, yeah good for him uh but um the other analogy i would make is that like is the one with like fellini who's also kind of like a, a dreamscape artist yeah um i think the best filmmakers are yeah i think most films that are successful are operating on some level of like dream logic that's why they're satisfying to people to watch yeah but it's very hard to say like what dream logic is because it's essentially it appears as something kind of illogical and irrational even though it's not has an incoherent kind of like um internal system of its own it evades description in a way yeah which is why you have to people have come up with terms like lynchian you know yeah or or it's like they refer to a um a mode of synthesis of sort of like cinematic alchemy that is doing something that's difficult to describe yeah exactly and i think like i've been critical of lynch in the past and people have gotten really kind of disproportionately angry Mm -hmm. with this totally subjective opinion um you know people get angrier with with me about lynch than they do um like i could come out as like a zionist which (laughs) i'm not by the way um and I feel like that people would tolerate that more than me, like criticizing Lynch. But I think that's also because he occupies the same role as Fellini in a lot of people's minds, which is that he's like an early formative influence mm-hmm. that gets you um, really into film. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, I saw Blue Velvet when I was in high school. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I like didn't know movies could be like that. Exactly. You know? Like there are great, you know, there are many types of great directors, but nobody's like Robert Altman or Terrence Malick was my first kind of yeah, entry right. point not into a good, cinema. Right. It's always somebody who's kind of like maximal mm-hmm. and dreamy. Ex- accessible. Yeah. Ultimately, even if he is kind of like evasive and convoluted, he's still very accessible aesthetically. Yeah, and, like, the other thing is, like, I think you can understand him on many levels. Like, he is populist, and he's also very intellectual, but he really is, like, the auteur of, like, midwits Mm -hmm. because he is accessible. Mm -hmm. So I think people very understandably, like, jealously guard their attachment to Lynch. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say this much. It's going to be really horrible and tragic when he goes because we're going to be... Definitely. Like, kind of... We'll be down another great tour. Yeah, exactly. And there's very few of them left. Well, yeah. I mean, so few people make movies the way that he does. And I feel like what's even sadder is that people, which maybe is a good segue into this um, mm-hmm. LA Review of Books article, that people don't even really know how to watch movies anymore. Yeah, that's well said, yeah. Um, and so his, yeah, his passing... Which we shouldn't even talk yeah, about. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna like <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, it'll definitely be the, sad. He's gonna live a long time. He's doing all that transcendental meditation. The TM's gonna keep him going, baby. He has a great head the of hair. Of health. Yeah. He's slim, mm-hmm. but not too slim. Trump supporter. Oh yeah. That was also the the best thing about David Lynch, by the way, is not that he's a Trump supporter. It's that he's so cool because he he you know doesn't mix politics and art no but he gave that awesome sound bite when was that in like 2016 or 2017 where he basically implied like almost copped to being a trump mm-hmm. supporter well he's doing well, interesting of course things he and, likes trump yeah totally trump is a lynchian candidate he is, yeah. <laughs> his bloated weird body and <laughs> 
he looks he would Modious look at home. strip of hair yeah exactly he would look really good in that twin peaks red room you know definitely or as like one of those like creepy old people yeah that show up in his movies who like impart haunting aphorisms he could definitely do yeah totally like that. oh i wanted to ask you actually because maybe you have an interpretation of this the mm. one thing that kind of like bothered me about not like in any critical sense but in a kind of i was struggling to understand it myself what's up with the old people that a company mm-hmm. that betty meets you know it's implied on her trip and then yeah. and then they appear again in diane selwyn's last hallucination in miniature and then they're like chasing her through the apartment yeah i don't know i mean my like kind of freudian read is maybe they're like a proxy for her parents or something yeah. or like yeah they're just some figures who've like seeped in and out of her dream consciousness somehow and yeah or like i don't know like the kind of and the camera stays with them after they leave her at the airport too for quite a long beat yeah when they're in the car Mm -hmm. and actually it's like he's really good at setting up um scary suspenseful scenes that are not like too over the top and it watching that scene i almost felt like they were going to get into like a bloody car wreck or something i was like baiting my breath and then you know nothing happens i don't know or they're like an american gothic like uh you know reminder that beneath this idyllic veneer of white picket fence middle america there is this like rotting horrible core. yeah like supernatural horror mm-hmm. but i can't really like i want i want like a neat like cut and dry explanation for the old people because they're kind of like a weird out of place detail it looks like you're gonna have to look up some youtube videos i'm just i'll just wait for the the subreddit to Mulholland drive explained <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, shall we sh- shall we discuss um um Enzerink's y- essay yeah so she opens the essay with an anecdote about being in college and mingling with film students mm-hmm. and feeling um you know having this sort of blossoming love for cinema but also being kind of intimidated and like meeting a guy at a party who asks her what her favorite movie is and she tells him it's Mulholland Drive and he tells her that oh he likes that movie too and then he I'll just read it because this is like a stupidly important anecdote yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. the guy henceforth known as Mr. Cowboy um due to him mentioning he has a theory about the cowboy in Mulholland Drive, ended up harassing me for the better part of a semester, forcefully demanding that we go for lunch or dinner or coffee to discuss the genius of lunch. The one time I caved and agreed to meet him, he sat waiting with an overpriced meal for two already ordered, revealing only then that it was his birthday and that he had chosen to spend it with me, trying to guilt me into something more. It made me feel uncomfortable that I shared something so intimate, a favorite film with this person. After all, if we shared the same taste, felt affected so deeply by the same text, did that not then mean there was some commonality between us? She then goes on to talk about how this person's behavior mirrored exactly the type of predatory deviant whiteness that Lynch often takes as his subjects. He exemplified exactly the kind of white men that Lynch focuses his work on, those who believe that society is in decay, that the spirit of American grandeur is sleeping from their very hands, tugged away by women, by people of color, by anyone who does not subscribe to their vision of labor or domesticity. Mr. Cowboy's engagement with the film was no coincidence, but rather the result of his identification with a key plot line. Um. <laughs> This is like Mr. Cowboy did nothing wrong. First of all, he was just trying to take you out on a date and buy you a nice dinner. He was like a. He it clearly was, sounds. I mean, it's so needlessly cruel. Actually, yeah. her, the way that she writes about him. Yeah, and with like mortification that they would have anything in common. Yeah, it's like I'm sorry. You have in common that you like David Lynch. You and everybody. It's like saying I like drugs and music. I used to work with like, you know, I, I worked at an Italian restaurant and one of the, the waiters um, would always say, I like a drugs and a music as if it was like a, a unique and special thing when like literally everybody likes drugs yeah. and music. But also, bitch, you think you're so fucking special that it would be like beneath you to find commonalities with this like 
Aspergian college student who tried to ask you out on a date and bought you dinner. Yeah. And it's funny because this, this review is basically implying that, um, that this guy's a white supremacist. Yeah, no, literally it's, um, but it's implying that David Lynch is like a peddler of white supremacy and toxic masculinity. And it's like that, that was such a clear cut, like awesome demonstration of toxic feminine femininity. If I've ever seen one, Oh, is that what? Okay. I pulled up a photo of her to show Anna. I'm being a bitch, but of course, you know, I see why this was such a significant moment in her life. A man (laughs) showed sexual interest in her. Um, (laughs) This woman, by the way, if you, you know, if you read her little bio at the bottom of the article, um, she's an assistant professor of like media studies or something at the American university uh, of Beirut in Lebanon. So she's like literally like a psyop who's, exporting this like pernicious woke ideology to oh, people who have no history or context for mm. it and it's like what are you talking she's like she's like the peak the pinnacle of the sort of people that like david lynch coming from missoula montana is horrified by and makes mm-hmm. movies about totally like the stifled rage of the awful the sexless like why are it why is it always the sexless media theorists who like have the hardest time grappling with Enjoying media. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, some of the, you know, there, there's like an ongoing discourse conversation in academia, or there was last time I checked, um, as to whether film criticism or any criticism, art criticism, mu- music criticism, whatever, is um, an art form of its own. Mm-hmm. And generally, I err on the side of no. It's a, I think of it as a craft because it's so um, yeah. fully dependent on an existing artwork for its own existence. But in the case of like woke criticism like this, I'm going to, you know, kind of suspend my principle and say that in fact it is an art form because it's so far fetched and like untethered from the reality of the artwork. Yeah. Yeah. Like she, like sh- we're clearly watching a different movie, you know? yeah like it, it it's crazy to watch Mahal and drive or like any movie that she would watch presumably and like arrive at the conclusions she does and to be a, a fan of it as, as she says which yeah she's she's also like clearly a, a fan but has to frame it in this like reluctant way but that's what she these- can't handle yeah she can't handle the things that the things that she likes about the film might be problematic yeah that there is a, right that there's like she goes on to talk about sort of like misogyny and violence and exploitation of women um but she has to retroactively revise and justify it under this societal critique yeah because she can't just admit that like it's entertaining and fun to watch women be exploited and abused in films it's yeah a, it's been a tenant of, of filmmaking for for ages ages since time immemorial she like can't cop to the fact that she enjoys watching their pillowy lips and like doughy breasts (laughs) come into contact with each other but this is like classic feminist um bullshit it's like you know all of the discourse around the handmaid's tale Mm -hmm. which i was reminded of recently um liberal feminists really need their moralism to enjoy the salacious parts of artworks. Mm -hmm. Like they have to rationalize that they're kind of like, there's like a moral lesson or a moral tale because really they like, um, you know, uh, gore and rape and social ostracizing. (laughs) Like they get off on those It's reminiscent of like evangelical Christians who like in that hell house documentary where they make the, they construct these like elaborate haunted houses, even though they don't technically celebrate Halloween, Uh but they clearly really want to. So the premises of all their haunted houses are like, what happens to you when you go to hell? (laughs) But they're still, they're just as like salaciously fixated on the, the torments and the torture and the violence. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's like really, like again if i wasn't in such a zen space at this time in my life and viewing these kind of um articles as like conceptual art i would be probably pretty angry and outraged because it's such an insult to david lynch's oeuvre oeuvre, Mm -hmm. to his body of work his body of work (laughs) to 
uh, pigeonhole him using like the contemporary lingo of identity politics. Mm -hmm. Like this man has spent his whole life transcending Mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. And weaving immaculate, elaborate dreamscapes for you retards to enjoy. And this (laughs) is how you're going to do him. Well, she says to that point, if Lynch's entire oeuvre and his own (laughs) understanding is linked to the philosophies he has adopted from Hindu sacred texts, transcendental meditation and Vedic physics, why are there no people whose ancestors originated these texts in his films? I love that this is like a paint by number of like woke grievance. I think like it can't, she can't be serious. This has to be ironic. I mean, she's this, what's her name? Susan. Uh, er, 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 she's all the of greatest these, like, artist of our time. Chicks have like a list of a checklist that they consult whenever they pen one of these little articles where they like, um, are looking out for like some case to be made for cultural appropriation, some case to be made for, misogynistic impulses some case to be made for racism yeah yeah it's like incredible she says that the demonic bum behind the dumpster at the is um black is yeah. controversial due to its it's being evocative of blackface he should have just put like an aunt jemima like mammy <laughs> figure <laughs> i haven't thought that i mean that's their own like bad faith projections too because exactly. not once have i thought have I seen that scary bum in Mulholland Drive <laughs> yeah. and been like, oh my God, is that blackface? Yeah, no, seriously. Because they literally have like soot and dirt on their face. I would never, it's never even occurred to me. He's like homeless and hasn't showered and lives on LA Because he's like row. a demon. He's yeah. like a, a metaphysical demonic presence in the reality of the film. You no, know, these people like unanimously telling themselves they're really great because they're like the confederate flags of liberal discourse <laughs> they just like you know reveal expose themselves every step of the way it's offensive um, she calls the film unbearably misogynistic and refers to its, its unfortunate timelessness i mean i'm just like if it's unbearable and unfortunate why are you watching it let alone mm-hmm. commenting on it mm-hmm. they couldn't have paid you that much at the la times you know she got like it's the la review six, of books. Oh, oops i thought it was the last called it the times Sh- twice but Sh- whatever Sh- it doesn't matter okay. it's fine they're all the same yeah um the la review of book i mean it's also perverted for they're la to have a her. review of books just saying because <laughs> no one there can read yeah it's not the london review of books or like the new york review of books um she says, my intention is not to reduce Mulholland Drive to a tale of political morality, but to take seriously the question of why, more so than any film than, that tries to speak directly to the political climate, a ham crash. It remains so hauntingly apt, but it's literally her intention to reduce it to like a tale She's of such political a bad, morality. Bad writer. It's like that um, CIA recruitment video that we <laughs> talked about where the woman like lists, like literally goes down a list of her like, identity affiliations and then is like but i am not a box checking exercise Mm -hmm. like this is what this article reads like it's really like impressive um right i haven't i have not this is to me was sort of the the thesis that came after the the bogeyman emerging from behind the trash can itself a controversial figure his soot covered face invoking the specter of blackface (laughs) does not depict a singular discrete fear, but demands us to confront our personal ones. Given Lynch's interest in meditation, this is perhaps unsurprising. This is both the film's strength and its downfall, depending on your perspective. Mulholland Drive ostensibly performs a wide reaching critique of society, yet at the same time is so abstract and esoteric that it also lends itself to readings that perpetuate the exact toxic myths and inequalities that Lynch takes aim at. So, like, in other words... It, Everyone gets something different from it. Yeah, I mean, that's like... A, it, so, like, yeah, in other words, it doesn't over-explain itself or force conclusions onto you, and it, like, encourages, encourages you to come up with your own interpretation, which means that different people will have, like, multiple readings and diverse interpretations, mm. which is a bad thing. <laughs> that's, like, literally what she's saying. Yeah. Um. So we're all supposed to be, like, as diverse and multicultural as possible but all subscribe to like the same like compliant like narrative around this film or like in of, around art in general is what she's arguing for and they don't want art people like this are not interested in in art so no. one wonders what draws them to 
to media theory and criticism if they just seem like they flat out hate art. Yeah, they they have like an almost religious zeal for like stamping out. They, they're very like ungenerous and uncharitable of spirit, but it's true. They literally hate art. Mm-hmm. I really don't understand that mindset. And then they, yet they feel The only compelled. thing they hate more than art is like white guys who ask them out in college. Yeah. I, I love art and I love white guys who ask you out in college. There's nothing <laughs> like wrong with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just weird because like she's advocating for a reality where like, you know, it, it's like a very incoherent reality where you're supposed to be like superficially unique mm-hmm. and literally a checklist of identities. Um, but all of us have to subscribe to like this one totally conformist. And she would never be world. happy if there were Hindu people in no. David Lynch's movies. She would still be like lambasting him for cultural appropriation. You, There's no, there's no winning. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like really crazy to whip out the cultural appropriation phrase in 2021 because I thought we were over that by now. I mean, they're still, they're still doing it. I mean, they're, yeah, it's an ongoing thing, an ongoing discourse or whatever, but it's also like, all culture is appropriation. Like literally the history of culture is the history of appropriation. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody mooching off of everybody else. There's nothing wrong with that. And also like David Lynch is so actually like relentlessly white. Mm -hmm. He's not really a cultural appropriator. There are literally no black people in his films. Well, that's, she says that that's, um, uh, that that is contradictory to his like private spiritual practices, which are based in, I guess like verdict physics and like yeah. Hindu philosophies. Yeah. I guess I think he just chants a mantra to get into like a meditative state. Yeah. He's like, Jaya. that allows him to Jaya. access. It's just like so rude how he doesn't cast any Hindu actresses, but he orders sag paneer <laughs> on seamless. Um, but yeah, no, these people, I think the problem is that like all religious fundamentalists, woke That's what it is, people really. are, they're literalists. Mm-hmm. They subscribe to like a very literal interpretation and they don't, they have a hard time distinguishing between like, say an actor and the role they play or a director and the film they make. Right. Like it's it's sort of like what happened to Angela Nagel with Kill All Normies where people accused her of promoting the views she was describing. Right. Description or depiction is tantamount to like endorsement. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's like very much like I've made this analogy before, but it's like very much like going to like the movie theater and thinking that the like tractor trailer on the screen is going to barrel out of the screen and slam into mm-hmm. you. Yeah, that's how these people interpret art, um, which again is very ungenerous, uncharitable, and frankly mean spirited. It's cruel. Yeah, and it's it's it it is cruel. It's like vindictive, punitive, whatever word that you want to use for that. I mean, the anecdotal straw man, Mister Cowboy, that she sets up at the intro of the essay, really tells you everything you need to know about it's like going to be like a a checklist of made up like petty grievances yeah and it's it's, she's she claims that this like character of the cowboy in the film is like a a white supremacist toxic masculinity mascot (laughs) which he's not he's like crazy i mean especially because the guy who asked her out didn't even seem like he did anything racist or even misogynistic yeah he just like literally was he was just like courting her in an awkward way she should be so lucky i know i know it's so like nice and innocent for a guy to like ask you out because you have mutual interests (laughs) Um, how dare he and i i kind of like what that cowboy guy says in the movie that like um to to the um director character he's like you know essentially like your attitude Totally. Like a man's attitude in life determines his outcomes put to some, some extent. Put some gratitude in your attitude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and actually, I think that that, that um, line applies not so much to Adam, but to Betty slash Diane, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Diane especially. Well, yeah. yeah. I like how you said that with like a New Jersey accent. Diane. 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 Well, Diane's problem is <laughs> caught in a negative spiral. Um, here's another hilarious line from the article i'm fine with like mocking this article 
for like the rest of <laughs> the show. Yeah. Um, uh, where was it? Um, she uh, Lynch's Uva runs the risk of replicating an unfortunate current in the white West to celebrate and endorse culture without materially supporting or advocating for the, the people it belongs to. Um, what is she talking about there? Which like, culture? The culture of the cowboy white culture. West. Okay. Um, yeah. Like cowboy culture. Yeah. <laughs> um, David Lynch basically has to pay reparations to both kinds of mm-hmm. Indians. I'm surprised she didn't bring up the dwarf. Yeah. That, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm surprised she didn't pick <laughs> up on the anti-Semitic thing, um, which I thought was personally hilarious, but um, I guess Jewish people are now. I wouldn't even uh, say it's anti-Semitic. I, mean, I would say it's just kind of uh, maybe stereotypical or like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm saying anti-Semitic dramatic. Semitic. Yeah. I think it's really funny. Value like, neutral Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love that. Like, that character exists um i'm not like i'm not offended by it okay you guys (laughs) um but like like what does she want david lynch to do to like i don't know set up a venmo for palestinian children (laughs) to expiate his guilt about making for making movies about like hot white people in the 90s i don't get it Mm -hmm. um and why does art have to like materially support or advocate for anything. Why does it have to have an implicit societal critique? Yeah. That's just such a weird way of appraising art. Especially a David Lynch movie. Yeah. I think, I think all good art, I would say does, I think it, it really does like call into question. It makes you question certain moral or ethical ideas by nature of it being like good but the minute art starts being moralizing it automatically becomes bad and it becomes propaganda yeah exactly i mean um and it's almost like they want this reality where like people do you think she gets mad at herself when she has problematic dreams (laughs) yeah (laughs) she's like flicking her bean to the handmaid's tail (laughs) because it's an educational program Mm -hmm. um there's like a lot of lessons about female oppression and it's funny because you know lynch strikes me as a guy who's like so actually again amenable to the kind of to female subjectivity definitely so many of his main characters are women and they're like yeah or i think he's almost not even that invested in any anyone's subjectivity per se his movies yeah. aren't, aren't very subjective yeah but they're not they're not really concerned with the kind of they're not uh, they're not like hyper narrative in the sense that they're like not really concerned with like individual personas or protagonists right they're like kind identities of yeah. yeah um she talks of course about how like whiteness is inextricably gendered mm. scripts of masculinity etc cetera, etc cetera. um to me uh, what do ha- these people want to see movies about like i don't know i think they you need know? like a, a paint by numbers like promising young woman type film yeah where everything is like explicitly over explained and kind of memed and not like morally complicated or nuanced in any way yeah where there's like a character that appears on the screen who's like men are trash now i'm gonna take revenge against them and that's like <laughs> the whole film or whatever like takes a sip her, from her male tears mug and also this is like oh, this article is like so hopelessly 2016 too she's Hers. not even at the cutting edge of identity politics oh, yeah yeah she's she's operating on a on an outdated model <laughs> yeah um, but yeah, I mean, I think like the, the interesting part of, uh, like Mahal and drive is that it, it's almost like you, this is like before the age of conspiracy theories, but it almost serves as like a defense of conspiracy theories mm. or like kind of like at least like an examination of them. Or because th- if yeah. you think about it, you know, like if you subscribe to this kind of popular explanation that um betty is like the positive fantasy alter ego of the kind of washed up and jaded diane um she literally kind of constructs like hallucinates 
a, a favorable fantasy world for herself because the reality is so much bleaker. Mm. Cause she's, you know, at the end of her rope essentially. Right. And then like spoiler commits suicide. And the parallels between, I mean, to me almost it's not just Betty and Diane. It's like all of the actresses and characters, the way that in a dream, every character that one encounters is really just like a part of one psyche. Yeah. Which is why my hot take is that it's all like the blackface bombs dream. Yeah. (laughs) No, that's like, I've never heard that explanation, but it's good or interpretation. (laughs) Well, you know, in the first, the first scene is literally um, like when, once you get like, first of all, it opens with those like bizarre dancing credits, which I love the jitterbug contest that um, Betty won. Oh, right. Oh yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um and then yeah, as as like a um as a testament to how how um low she's fallen. Um the I guess the implication uh, kind of at the end when she's in the Winkies booth with the hitman is that she's using the money that her aunt left to her to pay for a hit on um Camilla. Mm, right. Cuz she doesn't have any money of her own. Well, she has the same purse, which, by the way, did you notice that it's a DKNY no, purse? That no. was something I had never noticed before and which is a good, very, like, mid-tier brand. Yeah. So it's very Lynchian kind of to give yeah, yeah. Rita, like, a DKNY bag rather than, like, that has, like, a visible logo on it. Yeah. It's not some, like, hyper-sophisticated, like, tasteful yeah, production like de- or protection something. design production designed like bag it's like a decan yeah, like yeah, crossbody yeah. <laughs> no I, that, I didn't notice that but that's hilarious because that like decan y was like the michael kors of the late 90s and early aughts totally and like i remember even like being like a, a, a late teen and visiting the flagship in new york city because that's what like girls from new jersey wore is like decan y mm-hmm. Um, a more pretentious director, not that Lynch doesn't have his like pretentious moments, but um, someone who was like aping a Lynchian style probably would have opted for like a logo list bag or something that looked very generic or cinematic. Yeah. And I thought it was admirable that he would just use some like branded prop. Yeah. Bag. yeah like some tacky. I want to know, I, I would like a, a rundown of all the costume decisions on mm-hmm. in this movie. Um, Cause it looks great. I mean that first, like the opening scene of like the car crash, the mm-hmm. hit gone wrong. I mean, she looks so great. Just like stumbling around with her big gnats yeah. and like leaking from her head <laughs> in like a black cocktail dress. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the expectation, like these kind of like supernatural forces, and nefarious mobsters is you know so much more glamorous than the reality which Mm -hmm. is like professional and romantic failure ending in suicide (laughs) so like i think if you're gonna if you're gonna retroactively apply an inappropriate reading on it Mm -hmm. that's the one i would personally choose that the diane selwyn plot line is like the reality um, yeah, and that it, it it is kind of like it has like a conspiracy theory um, vibe to it in a weird way because you know in my mind like what are conspiracy theories? They're people's individual hallucinations on like a collective scale. Mm-hmm. That's sort of like <clears throat> what happens and and attributing sort of like supernatural or uh, metaphysical or like otherworldly evil to the mundanity of their like suffering. Yeah. And often being correct in, in diagnosing kind of an underlying a force of evil or malevolence, but getting the details wrong. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this very much applies to this article that we were discussing because this woman has this very kind of um, negative, Mm -hmm. paranoid conspiratorial view of, of Lynch that he's again uh, promoting white supremacy and toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, but she's misdiagnosing her own dissatisfaction and blaze. Right. Like she, she can't like, she's, she she, can't reckon with her own enjoyment of the film. Yeah. That from her warped perspective 
Exactly. And she, she, you know, miscasts again. Undermines her progressive values or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And she, yeah, she has to rationalize and misunderstand as a defense mechanism, her own misery, which has to do with her own inability to like let loose and enjoy herself and acknowledge to herself that she's titillated by um, certain cultural taboos. Mm -hmm. Like we all are. Mm -hmm. So I think that like, his movies literally kind of examine and all make light of this tendency. Sounds like she could have learned a lot from, yeah, from her she own needs Mr. To, yeah, Mr. She Cowboy. Needs to do another deep dive. Here's the, um, I'll close out the show maybe with the quote from the cowboy in Mulholland drive, mm-hmm. which this woman would, um, which is advice. This woman would do, well to heed a man's attitude a man's attitude goes some ways the way his life will be is that something you agree with did you answer because you thought that's what i wanted to hear or did you think about what i said and answer because you truly believe that to be right what did i say adam kasher says (laughs) uh that a man's attitude determines to a large extent how his life will be and the cowboy says so since you agree you must be someone who does not care about the good life (laughs) (laughs) If you fix your attitude, you can ride along with me. Well, yeah, no, and exactly. And I think like Lynch is like fundamentally having like rewatched this movie and like reread some of the criticism. He's fundamentally kind of like, she's not wrong that he's kind of a conservative director in his own way. Sure. Um, Like, I, I think that he's probably also not only kind of, aesthetically conservative and that he retreads old tropes which is cool and makes him kind of a singular artist but he's also probably a little bit politically conservative and probably kind of a trump supporter which like it's cool those people should exist in mostly liberal areas like hollywood Mm -hmm. because they really throw a wrench in everybody's plans um and i think he understands like nobody else like kind of what we're witnessing experiencing now which is that there really is like a um a kind of shadow like the the kind of dominant hegemonic liberal narrative that exists there's a shadow reality that that um it kind of recognizes and understands to be true but like again bungles the details of Mm -hmm. like the idea that like um like Russiagate, for example, this myth that the um, Russians were like tampering in American elections. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, whether they were or they weren't the United States. And they has, may as well have been in some like nominal way. You know? Yeah. It's, it's almost irrelevant. It's immaterial, but you know, America's bread and butter is literally doing soft and hard versions of regime change across the globe mm-hmm. or um, QAnon, the idea that, QAnon, as Glenn Greenwald said on Twitter a couple of days ago, is kind of the most insidious and prominent source of disinformation um, in our, you know, present day reality. Like it's not; it's the mainstream media, it's the fake news media. Yeah. So there's there's kind of like a, a kind of like hallucinatory quality to these liberal myths yeah. that, that dominate now. That's very well said. And I think Lynch gets this because he has a lot of practice and experience with, Mm -hmm. you know, living among the repressive elements of American society or the repressed elements rather. Yeah. And that kind of meta quality of this essay does actually make it a pretty good read. Yeah. (laughs) I would would recommend. Yeah. Anyway, um, I guess that's, do you have any last comments? No. Um, this was a fun episode because even in like talking through this movie, I have gained a newfound appreciation for Lynch and we'll stop dunking on him, even though I'm in no position. I think your critiques are, are valid. They're fine. You're You're valid, Anna. (laughs) I'm a valid LGBT. And like you said, there's a woman subjective. Yeah. There, I mean, yeah, that's the other thing. Like you should be able to have, it's okay to have qualms with auteurs. Yeah. They should welcome it, honestly. Yeah, I will say he's like in my pantheon of um, artists like Alex Jones and Steve Bannon because <laughs> he does have like a great head of hair, which is one of my Fantastic. main criteria. 
for men and artists. Anyway, see you in hell. See you in hell.